Good evening. Uh, my name is Todd Gable, and I'm going to be introducing uh, Dr. Allen uh, here. Uh, he's going to speak to us about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, sorry, the Institutional Revolution, as we've discussed. Uh, Dr. Allen uh, is the Burnaby Mountain Professor of Economics uh, at Simon Fraser University. Uh, that's my alma mater. And this is in Burnaby, British Columbia, Vancouver, basically. And uh, Doug has written on a wide array of subjects, uh, marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, divorce, farming, uh, Navy rules, transaction costs, and many other things that are seemingly disparate in their nature, but uh, they uh, typically have a similar theme that runs through a similar methodology. Uh, and so he's going to continue on uh, in that vein here for you and talk about the institutional revolution, dueling, and these other sorts of things. Uh, on a personal note, uh, Doug has been uh, my mentor, whether he <laughs> recognized it or not. Um, and he has uh, really been the reason for why I continued on in economics. Uh, even though I don't think I ever got more than a C plus in his courses, but uh, that's certainly probably more me than him. So. Uh, <laughs> But nevertheless, I, I hope he inspires you the, the way uh, he inspired me. And uh, with that, uh, Doug. Okay, thank you. I guess that's the way Todd's way I'm going to have to go back and change his grave, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I mean, it's uh, a pleasure to be in Tennessee. I was just here about a year ago, saw your brown parking on. I thought that was pretty cool. Not, not in this town, but in Nashville, but uh, you have a beautiful place. It's always a pleasure, too, to uh, see people come out and be interested in the kind of work you're doing, even if you're getting extra credit to be here or your arms are twisted or whatever. But I'm going to talk to you tonight about something that I hope you find is kind of a cool topic and something that you probably know a little bit about. But by the end of the night, I hope that I completely change the way you think about uh, this topic. So you know probably a, a, something about lords and ladies and aristocrats and uh, these sorts of things. You, you may have read Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice, seen a movie. Maybe you're watching Downton Abbey right now, the BBC series that's so popular. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And just to give a little plug here, I'm going to talk really about a chapter out of this book that I published this year called The Institutional Revolution. The idea in this book is that if you were to time travel back 300 years, whether that was in the United States or in England or France or wherever, you would really have no idea about how life was organized. You would just look around you and say, this is just makes no sense whatsoever. It's just so bizarre. Just to give you one example, there'd be no policemen around. And uh, somebody murdered your brother. Uh, you wouldn't even call it murder, you would call it wrongful death, and you would have to go investigate it yourself. You would have to privately hire somebody at a local court to help you along with that and take it through the court, and you would find <laughs> out that the judge himself actually owned the courtroom. Uh, it would be all very strange to you. And, and yet what happened in the 19th century, both in the United States, France, Germany, uh, England, was that everything changed. And uh, the world, in terms of the way we organized it, uh, completely flips into what we call the modern world right now. So if you traveled in time back to 1850, you'd notice that you know there are no cell phones and maybe the teeth are bad, but you know organizationally the world would look very similar to the way it does now, and uh, you, you, you'd recognize it as the modern world. So tonight, though, oops, I mean, that would happen. tonight we're just going to look at one little episode of this thing, and that's looking at the lives of this group of people called aristocrats. And I'm going to be calling them the pre-modern aristocrats, a group of people from that existed between about 1500 to about 1900, span of 400 years. And we're going to see if we can understand uh, the odd kind of things that they did, really strange behaviors. And I'll spend probably the most time talking about the oddest behavior that they did, and that was dueling. So dueling, very strange behavior. You know, if I showed up in Tennessee here and one of you touched my nose, and this was the uh, 1750s, I'd say, okay, that's it. You know, Don, tomorrow, pistols, we're shooting at each other, right? Uh, I went to a party, and you gave me a cold shoulder. Okay, that's it. You know, we're going to be 
you know, one of us is going to be dead tomorrow morning, right? right? What's going on in a world like that? So we'll see if we can uh, try to understand it. Some of you are econ majors, and uh, when you're studying econ, you get the idea that all there is to economics is prices and quantities, right? Supply and demand, price and quantities. I mean, we get a lot of mileage out of that model, but tonight we'll be talking about a different kind of economic model. It goes by all different kinds of names, but it's involved in informational economics, institutional economics, law and economics, whatever you want to call it. But we're interested in how did things get organized? That's another economic question that we don't often talk about, but that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now I know that this is Tennessee, and you have uh, you do have a historical background in in, uh, in in the English tradition, but you probably don't know that much about English history. So I'm going to give you just two slides of some little historical context, just so we're up to speed and you know sort of some facts about what's going on. So very brief little history about aristocrats. So you've got England, and in 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, you've got this guy called William the Conqueror. He's, uh, he's from France, there was no France at the time, but he's from a place called Normandy in northern France, and uh, he conquers England. And he claims all the land for himself, but he's got to rule it. How does he rule it? Well, he takes a lot of his kinsmen and his friends, uh, about 50, 60 of them, and he sets them up as what were called magnates. And magnates were essentially princes. And they were large landholders that owned multiple properties. They were lords. They had anybody who lived on their lands were serfs. They were tied to him as the lord. They were military people. They had they could raise an army. They often had knights. They lived in castles. And uh, there was very few of them, but they ruled England. And over the next 400 years or so, Lots of things happen in England. You get the evolution of Parliament. These lords become collectively more powerful. Collectively, they're more powerful than the king. <coughs> Often, some of these lords were rivals to the king in terms of wealth and power and military strength. And so you get this slow transfer of, of rights. Uh, you've got feudalism is dying, and at the end of the 15th century, you've got something called the War of Roses, where these lords have a major civil war in England, and a lot of them get killed. And so by 1500, there's only about 40 families that are ruling England. The other thing that's been going on in England at this time is that the, the civil administration, the, the government, if you will, it's, it's absolutely puny by any standard, but it's growing. And so the crown is interested in people to collect taxes, to uh, administer the duties of the government. So on the one hand, you've got these lords that have been kind of wiped out in the War of Roses. Uh, there's not that many of them to begin with. They're rivaling the king in terms of power, and, uh, and yet the, the state is growing. And this is uh, Henry, this, Henry VIII. You probably know about him. He's a man with all the wives. He's sort of what I call the first pre-modern uh, king. So <clears throat> around 1500, a new kind of aristocrat shows up. And Henry VIII is instrumental in creating these guys. He confiscates about 25% of the land in England from the Catholic Church, uh, picks the Catholic Church out, and he uses this land to create a bunch of these landed aristocrats. Now, these pre-modern aristocrats that we're going to talk about, they were quite different from what came before. So even though they had a lot of the same titles, like Duke and Marquis and Earls and all these sorts of things, they were very different. The first thing is they didn't live in a castle. They didn't have any knights. And although they might have served in the army or the navy, uh, they were not military people. They were administrators. They were people that, that uh, were part of the government. Uh, each individual pre-modern aristocrat was much smaller than the others. So his land holdings would have been small. Now by small, I mean, you know, he only owned 30,000 acres, right, instead of, uh, you know, 500,000 or something like that. The largest of these pre-modern aristocrats would have had, the Duke of Northumberland had about 180,000 acres. I mean, just stop and think, and the smallest would have had about 10,000. If you stop and think about that, the biggest farmers today, and there's been a massive growth in the size of farms in North America, Today, if you're a wheat farmer and you're farming 10,000 acres, that's a lot of land, right? These guys were controlling much bigger parcels than this 500 years ago. 
The thing we're interested in tonight is this idea that uh, they develop really weird and complicated social constructs. They had really bizarre ways of behaving socially, and that's what we're interested in, uh, in talking about. And there are more of them. So if there was 40 of these guys in 1500, by 1800 there were 300 <coughs> aristocratic families at the top end, the peers. By 1900 there's about 400. And so they're still a puny in size. They're just an absolute sliver of the population, but there's certainly more than the aristocrats before them. After 1900, this whole system is gone. So uh, in the 19th century, you get this rise of the middle class, the rise of the bourgeois, and by 1900, they completely take over. And, but they don't take over by force. These lords, uh, they voluntarily, this is one of the things we're gonna to wanna to explain, they voluntarily give everything up. And they sell all the land, most, for the most part, they tear down their great estates and homes, dismantle their libraries, all these kinds of things. So we're gonna to wanna to understand the rise of this group and their fall. And this rise and fall matches all the other institutional changes that were going on during this period, which is why I call it this institutional revolution. So that's one thing you need to know. The other thing you need to know when you're thinking about these aristocrats is you want to think about them in terms of a pyramid. And so at the very top of the heap were the dukes. In fact, at the very top of the heap, the top part of the pyramid is a group of people you call the peers. And the peers were dukes and marquees and earls and viscounts uh, and uh, these barons. Very small group, very rigid, very hard to get in. Could take a family 200 years once they start the process of becoming an aristocrat to actually make it into that group. So very small, very rigid, but very powerful. These, these tiny group of people, two, three hundred families, are running everything. They're running everything. At the bottom, you've got this group that we'll call the gentry. And it's much more. Some of these people have titles. They're knights or baronets. But a lot of them don't have titles. They're what are called esquires or even gentlemen. They, they had the title of mister. So mister was an actual title at the very early part of this, this period. Not everybody commoner would not have called himself a mister. But if there's 400 people in the top group, there's probably 15,000 people in the bottom group. Still, in a country of, of you know, several million people, that's just nothing. They're just a trivial, in terms of numbers, they're trivial. And yet together, they would own about 80% of the land in England, and they would control 100% of the civil administration. Now this bottom part, <coughs> it's relatively large compared to the top group. It's socially very flexible. People are moving in all the time from the top, so if you're the second son or a daughter of a, of a, of a duke, uh, well, too bad, you're now just part of the gentry. And you might drift down below that and become a commoner. At the same time, you've got commoners that are starting the process of moving into the aristocracy, and they're moving into this uh, gentry pool. And so there's quite a bit, it's very fluid and open, and people are coming in and out of this group all the time. And that's gonna be important, especially when we talk about dueling. When it comes to dueling, it's the gentry who's pulling up pistols. It's not the, uh, it's not the dukes. Okay, well, I want to convince you to begin with about uh, the strange world of these aristocrats. And if you're an economics major, or you're taking economics, I want you just to think about uh, you know, how bizarre this behavior is, how incredibly costly this behavior was. So the first thing to think about, if you've ever been to England and you've ever traveled around, and uh, a lot of these homes now are part of the National Trust, the museums, the first thing that's strange about this group, if you were an aristocrat, you had to, it wasn't a choice, you had to build what was called a seat. A seat was your home, your country estate. And look at the size of those buildings. They are just absolutely enormous. They really are the size of a hotel, and that's really what they functioned as, was a hotel. And these people would live in these buildings, but they really didn't live in all of these buildings. They would live in small sections of these buildings. And they would have massive numbers of servants to run them. And the bulk of these things, when you go there and you visit these things, the main floors were these great halls, great dining rooms, great libraries, uh, massive places for entertaining. But they really weren't functional as a place where you would live. So they built these enormous buildings, 
And they built them, this is the other weird thing, in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. So imagine, it's, it's uh, you know, 1650. It's not like there's a, a road and you just hop in your car and scoot down to London. I mean, you're in the middle of nowhere. You're three, four days away uh, from a major urban center. You're, you're miles away from the local village, right? Uh, very isolated places. Even today, when you go to a lot of them, they're still in the middle of nowhere, right? Now, why would you do that? The other thing is, so you would have, a, you would have a, an estate that's 20,000 acres, and maybe a lot of it was farmland. Well, the first thing you had to do was take like half of that, 5,000, 10,000 acres, and build enormous lakes and parks and uh, plant all these gardens which were manicured. So imagine the number of people you would have to hire to look after your lawn that's, you know, 3,000 acres or to manage the, the waterworks of these places. And again, if you go to these places or if you watch BBC and all these kind of things, you not only have this massive house, but they would build these Greek-like Parthenons and various facades and buildings all throughout these parks. And uh, that would cost a lot of money. So just again, imagine the, the, the expense that, that went into something like this. But imagine also the opportunity cost, the foregone crops and income that you're sacrificing by creating these things. Very costly. Oops. The other weird thing about these group of people is they say, well, what were they doing? most of the time. Now on the top here, I've got the uh, picture from, I can't remember her name, who's the latest Pride Prejudice star? Um, Keira Knightley. Keira Knightley. It was a Keira Knightley uh, version of uh, uh, Pride and Prejudice. What are they doing all the time in Pride and Prejudice? They're just having parties, right? Parties and dances. And they're really worried about these parties and dances, who's coming, and when they come, they really have to dance. Nobody can just sit on the side. Uh, they went on these elaborate picnics, they host you know, teas all the time. They have fox hunts, horse races. It's a, really a life of leisure. But not only is it a life of leisure, I mean, it's not like they're sitting around. I mean, they're engaged in all what they call port. Port was the idea that it's, it's leisure, but it's real expensive. You're inviting everybody. Often you invite the entire village who are living on your land, and they would participate in whatever event you were doing as well. And of course, you had to pay for all these things. Anybody watching Downton Abbey? <laughs> Boy, now I feel like a foreigner. You know? Wow. Okay, well, this is a BBC series right now. It's like won almost all the Emmys last year for Best Foreign uh, Mini Series. But it's, it's a story of this aristocratic family uh, at Downton. And this is Lord Grantham. He's the Earl of Downton. And now this question doesn't make any sense to you because you haven't seen the episode. But the interesting thing about these stories is this story starts in 1911, and it's now in season three, where it's 1920. This is after the, the aristocrats have dismantled everything. And so poor Lord Grantham, he's literally got nothing to do, but he does nothing all the time. And you're wondering, what were these guys doing? Were they doing nothing? Is, you know, what, you know, the women of the time, what were they doing? Well, they're doing needlepoint. These are the most educated women in the society, and they're engaged in needlepoint and piano playing, and, and this turns out to be really important. It's not like it was just leisure, right? You had to be good at this stuff, or else you were in trouble. Now, the one remnant of this world that we still live with, and as you've had Olympic Games in this neck of the woods with Atlanta, in our modern Olympics, when was the first Olympics held? Modern one. 1896, right, in Athens. There actually, there's a movement afoot in the, in the late 1870s to uh, get a new modern Olympics. <laughs> And one of the ideas for the modern Olympics that we live with to this day is that only amateur athletes would compete. Now, we have in our mind that the reason why they're amateur athletes is because somehow this is a higher, more noble type of athleticism. And you know all the controversies that come with professionals and amateurs and all the rest of it. That had nothing to do with why the modern Olympics are, were amateur. They're amateur because the modern Olympics were designed by aristocrats for aristocrats. And aristocrats were always amateurs at everything. If you were a professional, you were not an aristocrat. To be a professional was to be vulgar. And so the modern Olympics were designed so an aristocrat could show the world how much time he had wasted perfecting his backhand in tennis. That's what they were designed for. 
Now, the ironic thing is they're invented in the late 19th century, just when the aristocrats are dismantling the system. So the aristocrats go, but we're stuck with the modern Olympics, and we're stuck with this concept of amateurism, which, of course, had nothing to do with the ancient Olympics, which were designed for professionals. They uh, married their cousins, so there's Victoria and, uh, and Albert. Now, of course, George Washington and Martha, they were cousins, uh, but they were also part of uh, you know, the, what was the equivalent of the U.S. Uh, arist aristocratic class. Uh, but it was very common. They married among themselves. They married among themselves. There were all kinds of laws and social norms to prevent love marriages. That, you know, for an aristocrat to fall in love with a commoner was a death sentence. And uh, you know, it was, everything was done to prevent that. Again, another remnant of this is uh, we still have occasionally, especially if you belong to an Anglican church, the, the reading of the bands. The reading of the bands is where for a month ahead of the wedding, there's a public announcement in church uh, that so-and-so was getting married. That was an aristocratic innovation whereby uh, a, a lord would find out that his daughter or son was intending to marry somebody and he could prevent it. Uh, that was the purpose of that. They were totally consumed with this social mobility. Okay. And then the weirdest thing of all was that they dueled. I mean, the more you think about it, that is just the strangest thing. Think of all the disputes that you get into in a week, and none of them end in death, right? Very seldom. And it wasn't just death, it was highly ritualized death, right? There were strict rules, and, uh, you know, but they, it was a very much a major component of their behavior. Here's a picture of uh, John Churchill. John Churchill. So there's a little town in, in northern Manitoba called Churchill, and there's a river called Churchill. And it's a great trivia question for Canadians. Who was it named after? And everybody always says it was named after Winston Churchill. But then you tell them the city is 400 years old. It was established 400 years ago, so that doesn't make any sense. So they go, I don't know. And you say, well, it was named after John Churchill, who was the son of Winston Churchill. But not the 20th century Winston Churchill, the 17th century Winston Churchill. But he became the first Duke of Marlborough, but he dueled twice in his life. And uh, he was very similar to all of his gentry friends. They dueled on the way up to becoming dukes and earls and all the rest of it. Now, if you're an economist, you know this guy, the Adam Smith, sort of the founder of our discipline. Here's what he said about this whole procedure of aristocracy. He couldn't stand the aristocracy. He thought from an economic point of view, it made no sense whatsoever. He says, nothing can be more completely absurd. They're founded upon the most absurd of all supposition, suppositions. That the property of the present generation should be restrained and regulated according to the fancy of those who died perhaps 500 years ago? I mean, that makes no sense. Here I am, I own this land, but my, my great ancestor 400 years ago constrained it so I can't mine the land, I can't sell the land. Uh, why would you ever do something like that? Adam Smith said, go look at the yeoman farmer and look how much grain he's producing. And now go look at the duke and how much grain he's producing. There's no contest. These guys are a complete waste. Here's another uh, very good economist, but no better known as the writer, George Orwell. This is what George Orwell said about aristocrats. He said, they're bandits, simply parasites, less useful than fleas are to a dog, entirely functionless. The existence of these people was by any standard unjustifiable. Pretty strong words. Um, and so that's my job here today. I'm going to see if I can explain it. And I'm way behind schedule already. Now I just want to make the puzzle a little bit more interesting. So hopefully I've convinced you these guys to be engaged in really weird ways. And yet look at this. What did they do? In 1500, when these pre-modern aristocrats take over, England is a marginal nothing of a country. I mean, France dominates Europe, uh, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Portugal, these are much more powerful empires. England is nothing. It's a fringe, marginal country. And yet, so, oh boy, that didn't show up very well, does it? Um, that's supposed to be a picture of the world, but you get the idea. By the end, in 1900, when they give it up, they are the British Empire. I mean, you think the United States, greatest country in the world, uh, but in 1900, uh, England was uh, an incredible, it was the greatest country in the world. They had an empire where the sun never set, Britannia ruled the ways. I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was incredible. These guys, these guys oversaw the trans, 
formation of England from a nothing country to an enormous empire. And they controlled everything. They ruled Parliament, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. They ruled the army, the navy, the justice system, all public administrative offices. They controlled the lighthouses, the port commissions, everything uh, was controlled by this very tiny group of people. And so the question is, how did they do it? They became exceedingly wealthy doing it, right? But it wasn't a case of just exploitation. It's not like they were stealing the wealth from everybody else. The entire country grew rich, and they grew rich riding that wave. And so the question is, how? So what economic theory could possibly explain this? <clears throat> or is it irrational? Now here's the great descendant of uh, John Churchill. This is Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill figured this out. He said the following on this system. He said, the crown and the executive found in this system guarantees of fidelity and good conduct. Fidelity and good conduct. In other words, this system, these aristocrats were part of a system that guaranteed the crown could trust their servants. Trust their servants. Trust meant everything in this pre-modern world. And all of this behavior can be explained as a way of generating trust. Now, what, why is this important? You have to put yourself back to 1700, if you can imagine it. And uh, in 1700, during this period, nature was everywhere. Nature played an enormous role in your life. You could not go from one place to another without nature having something to say about it. They could not measure anything with any kind of accuracy because there was too much randomness in the world. They didn't know really what a, they, volumes. They, they would define what a bushel is but uh, one bushel from one part of the country was totally different from somewhere else. They could define distance, what a mile was, but in, there were different miles all over the country. They couldn't measure it with any kind of accuracy. A lot of measures just depended on human body parts, and human body parts vary all over the place. I'll just give you one example. If you've been to Europe, you've probably been to a lot of old town squares where there's a clock, and the clock will look something like that, and you will have no concept what's going on with that clock. That uh, it, there, in the late Middle Ages and this pre-modern period, hours didn't have a lot of meaning. They knew what it meant, but nobody could measure what an hour was. And so clocks like this would tell you what month it was and what season you were in, but that was about as close as it got. Right? It might tell you the day of the month that it was, but nobody knew what hour it was. They certainly didn't know what minute it was, and there was no concept really of a second in a practical, meaningful way. Now, let's just take this idea of time for a second. If we don't know what time it is, how are we going to set up a meeting? Let's meet at 10 o'clock. It just has no meeting. So how am I going to coordinate meetings with people when we don't know what time it is? It turns out, if you don't know time, you also don't know distance. And uh, because we measure distance by time. So now I, I, I don't know how far I'm going, and I don't know what time I'm going to get there. It's going to be impossible for me to coordinate with you. I don't know time, I don't know distance, and I also, this is a really important one, I don't know my location. Now one place where I really, it really matters to know my location is at sea. So around 1500, sailors discovered that they could figure out what the latitude was by you know, the distance of the North Star um, above the horizon. And uh, so that allowed Columbus to sail to a given latitude and try to keep us straight line as he sailed across. Uh, so they could sail across the ocean like this, but they had no idea of longitude. And that was a major problem. Ships would run aground, they would miss their target, they would miss each other, and virtually what they had to do is hug the coast all the time until they would come to a latitude and then sail to wherever they would hope they were going to get to. You sail the coast though, you're running into shoals and the rocks, in the islands, all kinds of things. People were lost at sea constantly. It was a major problem. It was the major intellectual problem of the 18th century was to solve this problem of longitude. It turned out, though, the problem was, the solution was time. And we never solved that problem until 1800. And so, no time, I mean, this is just one example of how you couldn't measure. Now, the problem is when you can't measure things is people cheat you all the time. So I set up a meeting with you at 10 o'clock tomorrow. But you don't show up. Why didn't you show up? Well, because you didn't know what time it was. 
and you didn't know where you were, and you didn't know how far it was. Oh, well, and that's true, you didn't. So how can I blame you, right? The ship is late, and the cargo is damaged. Well, whose fault is that? Is it the captain's fault? Because, you know, he was hanging out in a port in the South Sea, and he was sloppy with the cargo? Or is it because, you know, the wind bounced him around, and uh, he got lost on the way? Could have been either excuse. The problem with not being able to measure things is just people have excuses for cheating all the time. And if they have an excuse, they cheat all the time. Right? You know yourself. You're late to class all the time. The professor asks you why. You say because traffic was bad. Sometimes traffic's bad. Right? And so you can get away with it. And that was the problem that the king faced on every dimension. And so he needed people he could trust. Trust was more important than merit because they lived in a world where everybody could cheat like crazy. And so how did that system work? Well, they worked through this idea of patronage. Okay? What's patronage? Patronage is where a servant posts a bond. He takes a lot of wealth and he, he sort of puts it on the, on the table and he says, if I'm nice to you, if, if I'm working for you and everything's working out fine, my bond is okay and uh, you know, I'll become wealthy and everything will be fine. But if I screw up, if I cheat you, if I do the slightest thing wrong, even if you just suspect me of cheating, then my bond gets destroyed and I'm hurt. That's essentially how the system works. Now, by bond, I don't mean James Bond, and uh, I don't mean a financial bond. The key economic idea here is that a bond is what we call a sunk asset. Now, you know what a sunk asset is. A sunk asset is something that has no alternative value. You've done something, you've taken the void, that's supposed to be a toilet. You've taken your money and you've flushed it down the toilet. That's one example of a sunk asset. Right? It's gone. Or you've taken your money and you burned it. That's another way of thinking about a sunk asset. You took some wealth and you put it in a position where you cannot get it back. And effectively, that's what the aristocrats did. They took everything they had and they invested it in sunk assets. And so that if they screwed up slightly, the king would say, your history. You're out of the system, you're out of the loop, and all of your investment is gone. And so, knowing that, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I stay on my king's good side, my patron's good side, and he and what and the only way I can do that is to behave properly, and the king will trust me because he knows that I posted this big bond. By the way, if you want to interrupt me at any time, go ahead. There's uh, anybody watch the Tudors? My goodness, either you don't watch any TV, or you're watching just those uh, NASCAR races or something. You really need to. Oh, does that matter? Just slide NASCAR. Okay. Um, the Tudors. Well, it's another great BBC uh, production. Okay. So this guy is Thomas Cromwell. So Thomas Cromwell, he's he's the Lord of the Privy Seal. So he has one of these great offices. He was made the first Earl of Essex, and uh, when he was trusted, and he was trusted for a long time, he became extremely wealthy. He was in charge of all kinds of projects for the king, and he paid very well for them. If he's suspected of not acting on his patron's interest, Henry VIII, then Henry VIII's got a lot of options. He can say, okay, you're, you're removed, you're out of here. Nobody's allowed to talk to you anymore. You can keep your house, but it's out in the middle of nowhere, and you're just by yourself. Good luck, you're gonna get very lonely out there, right? Nobody's gonna come to your party. I might kick you out of office, and if it's really what you did bad, I'm gonna kill you, right? So these guys could be executed any time. If you know anything about Cromwell, uh, of course, he was executed. He, uh, what was his terrible offense? He picked the wrong wife for King Henry, right? He picked Anne of Cleves, and as, uh, and as uh, Henry said, she has the face of a horse, and she smells off with her head. Uh, so, you know, you could be, uh, you could get, you could be on the wrong side, for sure. Okay, so let's think of, uh, let's go through and we'll see if we can try to understand these behaviors through this lens. Through this lens of investing in sunk assets to guarantee trust. So how did you become an aristocrat? I'm going to talk a little bit about the strict family settlement, why they live so extravagantly, and why they do. Hopefully I'll have time to uh, go through. Okay, we should be okay. Entry and exit. So I've kind of talked about a lot of these things here, but how did you become an aristocrat? Initially, I'm going to focus on people that already had some wealth. 
So there are always merchants, there are always politicians, there are always adventurers, explorers, there are always people around with wealth. So let's think about how somebody with wealth become an aristocrat. The first thing they did, and I'm sure I say by the way, lots of people were wealthy and decided not to become aristocrats. There are always people like that around, that they just said, these investments are not worth it. I'm still gonna, I'm just gonna be a merchant and I'll stay rich. And I will have big land holdings, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna engage in any of those dumb behaviors. So, but if you wanted to become an aristocrat, the first thing you had to do is buy a significant land holding. You would build this enormous hotel that, in this isolated place. You would start investing in the proper education. So you would send your kids to only a few schools. There are only five schools in England that these aristocrats attended. Eden, Westminster, Winchester, Eric, those kind of places. And when you went to these schools, you absolutely were not allowed to learn anything of any use. Kind of like, you know, your economics class. But uh, you, you had to take basically Latin and ancient Greek. And you would read poetry, and you would read the same poem over and over again, and that's all you do. They, they wouldn't teach you law, they would not teach you philosophy, or anything that had any conceivable use, it had to be useless knowledge. And often you just repeat the same thing year after year after year. Okay? That's kind of important. It was totally useless. The worst thing you could do is give your son a trade, right? Or a profession, medicine, law, or anything like that. If you did that, boom, you're out. Uh, you had to leave your profession, business, or merchant enterprise. So you were wealthy, you got wealthy doing something, you had to abandon it. You had to sell off everything. So if you had a business or some kind of trade or profession, you had to leave it. You could not continue. If you continued, or even if a member of your family continued, uh, it was the death knell. You would never be an aristocrat. Has anybody here, throw me a bone here, has anybody read Pride and Prejudice or seen the movie? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, what, if you remember, so Pride and Prejudice is about this uh, marginal aristocratic family, the Bennetts, and Elizabeth Bennett falls in love with Mr. Darcy, and uh, he's going to be a duke one day, and uh, Darcy and his friends, his friends are talking about Elizabeth Bennett because she has an uncle, do you remember? And they're mocking her for her uncle's job. Do you remember what her uncle's job was? Anybody? What? No, he's not a black man. He's a lawyer. And this is like, I mean, they're like, you know, <laughs> you know I, who would have a lawyer for, uh, I mean, we think badly of lawyers today, but I mean, back then, being a lawyer, I was like, okay, forget it. He can't marry her. Her uncle is, uh, you know, he's a lawyer. Uh, you would usually engage in some kind of loyal service, like in a military profession. And then, if you did all of that, maybe after two or three years, uh, they let you in. And when they say let you in, they'll say, okay, maybe you can be the justice of the peace. And maybe in another generation, then maybe you'll get a title. Maybe we'll call you a, a, you know, a baron or something like that. So you're basically in when you were accepted. Now, the key thing I want to point out here is all these activities are sunk. You spend a lot of time learning Latin. That's total waste of time. Right? Total waste of time. It's only of a value... Because it's a sunk asset. You're, you're telling the king, your patron, you're saying, look, okay, I wasted all this time. The only reason, you know, I wasted all that time. So if you fire me from the civil service, what can I do? I can't go and work at anything. All I know is Latin, and that's totally useless. Now you might say, oh, it's not useless if you're a judge. Well, that's true, but you can only be a judge if you're an aristocrat. So it's only that the, the tool is only useful while I'm in the group. If I'm out of the group, it's completely useless. Uh, you know, my big hotel is useless to me. You know, all my, my, I can't, I'm not a profession anymore. I gave up my business. I've got nothing, nowhere else to go, right? I'll just have to live on my estate. And here's the thing. If there's a slight breach of trust, if, even after you've been going at this for two or three generations, and there's a slight breach of trust, and I mean slight, it doesn't have to be much, you're out. You have demonstrated you cannot be trusted, you're gone. No second chance, no nothing. Well, that makes perfect sense in a world where you're trying to encourage trust through sunk investments. And I threw this up here just to scare you. But uh, anyway, there was something that these aristocrats did. It was called the strict family settlement. And basically, it was a very complicated contract. And uh, it, it, it arose for a certain reason. So remember those early lords, the magnets that I told you about? They had a system what was called primogenitor. Primogenitor meant that uh, the oldest son got everything. And he literally got everything. 
And, uh, but part of primogenitor was, even though you owned the land, the land was constrained, and so you couldn't just tear down the castle and build something else. The, 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 the land, the castle, everything was really owned by the family. And the, the duke, the lord, he was really just a tenant, a tenant for life. He got to live off the proceeds, but he really couldn't do anything with the land. Now, that made some sense in the system, but a strange thing happened in the 16th century. In the 16th century, the courts ruled that you could not do that. You could not put a permanent restriction on land. And we have that decision is still in existence in today in our own property laws. Well, this caused a problem with the three modern aristocrats because remember what I said, they had to invest in a sunk asset. And they had to invest in land. But now if there's no restrictions on the land, if I can buy some land and then I take a shot at being an aristocrat and I screw up and you kick me out, well, now I can just sell my land. And I can go back to uh, doing whatever I was doing before. Well, then that doesn't work. The land has to be sunk. What are you going to do? And these aristocrats came up with an ingenious solution called the strict family settlement. So the strict family settlement was the following. I, I buy some land, and now I create a contract. Who's my contract with? It's with my 21-year-old son and my 21-year-old grandson, who is not even born yet. And so the only way this contract can be renegotiated is if the three of us get in a room and decide to renegotiate. But of course, by the time my grandson is not born yet, he's 21, I'm probably already dead. And so this contract, once established, could never be broken. And even in the odd times when uh, they could break it, nobody ever did. Why did they never break it? Because what this contract did was it made the land sunk again. So it said that me, as the owner of the land, I'm only a tenant, I can't sell the land, I can't mine it, I can't use it for any kind of business purpose, I'm not allowed to rip down the house. I can't do anything. All I can do is live off the stream of income. And what does that do? It makes the asset sunk. I can't sell my title. I can't sell my library. I can't sell any of it. It was an ingenious solution that took some assets and made them all sunk and, uh, and allowed it to, uh, to, uh, to in encourage trust. Uh, so it gave provisions for the younger sons, etc. He kept everything together, and it even allowed for demographic failures. Kind of, these guys always died out. They, they, the, the chance of having enough sons that would live often never happened. And so these, these contracts allowed for daughters to inherit, and the, the husband usually had to adopt the name of the family. And if there was no daughters, then it allowed other pseudo-kin to marry. They're, they were very complicated. Uh, okay, so for the Pride and Prejudice crowd here. Uh, in Pride and Prejudice, if you watch one of these timepiece movies and they're talking about how wealthy somebody is, they didn't talk about it the way we talk about it today, right? Today when we say somebody's wealthy, we say, you know, Bill Gates, he's worth $60, $60 billion. We talk about his wealth level, his stock of wealth. How did they talk about Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice? How wealthy was he? Did they say he's how much he made a year. They'd say, Mr. Darcy, he's worth 10,000 pounds a year. The reason why they talked about the flow was because Mr. Darcy did not own the estates. He only owned the income. So it was the income that mattered, not the stock. And that was reflected in this strict uh, family settlement. The extravagant living. So, you know, these large gardens, hunts, parties, all this kind of stuff that we talked about. Well, those are all sunk assets, right? I built a lake. Well, now I can't farm it. So when I get kicked out of the civil administration, I'm going to have a really hard time eating the lake. Can't make a living off it. It's a sunk cost, right? The house is sunk, the parties are sunk, and these were very visible sunk investments. Okay, so if, they, if there's a breach, they lose everything. All right. So that's what happened if I was wealthy. If I was wealthy and I wanted to be an aristocrat, that's what I would do. And for guys like John Dudley, he was a very wealthy man. It was really no problem for him to become the first Duke of Northumberland. Uh, he just did all of those things and he made it. But here's the problem. There's another problem. The problem is there weren't that many people around that had that kind of wealth that could become aristocrats. And remember what I said, I mean the, the civil administration is growing throughout this period. And so they needed a way of allowing people from the bottom, these gentry, these Mr. Bennets, if you will, they needed a way for them to move up into the top. But they weren't going to move up by buying a whole bunch of stuff, right? They didn't have the wealth. So 
How are you going to solve that problem? So if you're just some young gentleman, or maybe you're just a young John Churchill, you don't have any money, right? John Churchill, his dad was just, he had 10 acres, and they barely eked out a living. They were this marginal gentry family, but as marginal as you can get. And yet he grew up to be the first Duke of Marlborough, the most, uh, probably the most brilliant military leader, more so than even Napoleon. Uh, you know, how did he do it? Well, here's where dueling comes in. Dueling. The way these guys did it is that they made a, a different kind of sunk investment. So they invested their time and their energy in activities that were totally useless. These were the guys that are going to the parties all the time. They're going to the schools. They're learning the Latin. Uh, they're, they're just being dandies at court. Uh, you know, they're learning how to use a proper fork and uh, how the latest dance move. And all these kinds of things. That's what they're doing. They're investing in relationships. They're totally tied into the aristocratic group. These are sunk investments. So if they get kicked out of the group, then they lose all that investment and they're just a commoner with nothing. So it's still a sunk investment. They can still be trusted if they make this kind of investment. But here's the other problem. These investments are unobservable. The king has no problem telling if you put on a big hunt, right? He has no problem in telling that you built an enormous estate. He has no problem in saying that you invested in the strict family settlement. But how the heck am I going to tell if you make friends while you're at Eaton? And that those are your only friends. And that you don't have uh, you know, friends on the outside. I can't tell. And so now we got a problem. Because now I'm going to have cheaters. I'm going to have people pretending I'm some young gentleman or young commoner. I'm going to pretend. I'm going to be like a Mr. Wickham in Pride and Prejudice. I'm going to pretend that I'm a gentry. I'm going to pretend that I made all these investments. So trust me, trust me, trust me. And then when I get in the system, I'm going to cheat like crazy and I'm going to rob you blind. I'm going to be a fox in the hen house. Right? So that's the problem that the king faced. Enter the duel. The duel, what was the duel? It was a test. It was a test to see if you had invested in this social capital, in the sunk social capital. So formally, in economics, we would say it was a screen. It was a filter. It was a filter for these marginal guys. It was not designed for dukes. It was not designed for kings. It was not designed for business people or commoners. It was for this marginal group to make sure they had invested in relationships and that they had keep, keep kept on investing. That's what it was. It was a test. And it worked like this. If you accepted a duel, the duel was designed, you have to appreciate that it was designed so that if you accepted, you demonstrated that you had invested in social capital and therefore you were allowed to participate in this aristocratic society. It was designed so that if you rejected the duel, you demonstrated that you were a pretender and that you could not be trusted and that you were not allowed to participate in this society. So, anybody recognize that guy? One of the writers, of the, he's a lexiographer in the 18th century, Dr. Samuel Johnson. In a state of highly polished society, an affront is held to be a serious injury. It must therefore be resented, or rather a duel must be fought upon it. As men have agreed to banish from their society one who puts up with an affront without fighting a duel. I go to the party, and this gentleman didn't say hello, and I say, oh, that's okay, I'm just uh, okay. You know, that's okay. Uh, yeah, boom, I'm kicked out of society. He was uh, rude to me, and I didn't challenge him for a duel, gone, right? Or I say, okay, hey, you didn't say hello, and uh, tomorrow I'm gone, right? We're having, we're having a duel. And he decides, no, no, sorry, sorry, uh, you know, hi, how are you doing? Out, gone. Uh, he turned down the duel. So if you, don't, if you don't challenge for the duel, or you don't accept the duel, you're gone, you're history. You're, you're not allowed in, okay? Again, kind of bizarre, but that's because it was a test. It was a test. Now, it was designed to be difficult to fake. You don't want people faking duels because then they're faking the test. It's like, you know, cheating on, a, on an Econ 100 exam, right? I mean, you get 100%, but it doesn't mean anything to the rest of us. We want to make sure nobody fakes it, nobody cheats. We want it to be easy to verify. We want to make sure everybody knows it actually took place. Because we could get together after the party and say, let's just tell everybody we dueled, okay? So that's not going to work either, right? Uh, it's got to be unenjoyable in and of itself, right? So we don't want some sickos who's like, yeah, I just love getting cut up with, you know, swords and things. We don't, we don't want things like that. 
It's costly. It's, it's an expensive kind of institution, right? It excludes a large number of people from service. It results in death and injury. If you're an Alexander Hamilton fan, of course, you're very much opposed to dueling. Uh, create an incentive for investing in dueling skills. We don't like people having arms races in these things, and yet the police cheerleading. So, so it was a very costly institution, but it was necessary at the time because we had to know if these people could be trusted. So I'm not going to go into too much in the I shouldn't even put this slide in here, but it has a bunch of conditions. So the way you design the duel, there was a couple parameters, and the most important parameter was the probability of dying. So they had they all these different rules and weapon choices that adjusted the probability of dying. And so you designed the duel such that a pretender always rejected the duel. An investor, somebody who's investing in the social capital, a legitimate guy, he always accepted it. It was designed that way. The marginal aristocrats, aristocracy, they always prefer to invest rather than pretend. And here's the interesting thing. There's always going to be a group of people in society who are so low on the social capital ladder that no matter how hard they try, they would never have an incentive to become an aristocrat. But they'll always have an incentive to pretend. So I'm so low. I was born in the gutter, and uh, you know, but I'm, you know, I, I can dress up and I can play the part, uh, I'll pretend to be an aristocrat. But everybody observed that I was born in the gutter, and uh, they know that it, I, I would never invest really in learning Latin and all those other kinds of things, so it would be too hard for me. And they know, therefore, that I'm always a pretender. And so the way they dealt with this was, dueling was illegal for everybody, but it was not enforced for the aristocrats. So if you were a commoner and you were found dueling, that's attempted murder, and you're in trouble. You're an aristocrat and you're duly, that's okay. You know, you never we're never gonna arrest you. If you did get arrested, we're never gonna charge you. If you did get charged, we're never gonna find you guilty. If we found you guilty, uh, well you're pardoned. I mean, no aristocrat was ever convicted of duly. Which by the way sorry? Except Aaron Burr. Uh, well we'll come to Aaron Burr. I guess we'll have to talk about Aaron Burr here in a second. Uh, so I'll go through this fast so we get to Aaron Burr here. Uh, limits on participation. So what's the evidence for this? Well, the first bit of evidence is there's no point in making the Duke duel because uh, the Duke, we know he's, he's okay. He's invested in his land and everything. He's not supposed to duel. So Dukes were not allowed to duel. Occasionally they did, but when they did, they got in a big pile of trouble. And uh, the, the crown set up special courts for them to settle problems with people not saying hello to the party. But uh, they were not allowed to duel. The royalty was not allowed to duel. People at the top were not allowed to duel. The lower members of society, not allowed to duel. The only people that were allowed to duel were people like John Churchill. Marginal aristocrats on their way up. Why was the cause of the duel irrelevant, right? There were, there were limitless numbers of grounds for duels. There was no set number of reasons. You, you suggest somebody's lying, duel. You know, you slap them, duel. You cold shoulder, duel. I mean, there's just a million reasons. It didn't matter what the reason was. Why? Because you want people to be subject to this test at any moment. It's one thing to, to rig a duel once or twice with your friends, but now I don't, I'm in a room with you guys, I don't know, I could be challenged at any moment, right? You want people to be challenged all the time because you're constantly wanting to test them. Uh, it didn't matter who the challenger was or the challenged because we don't care. We don't care. All we care is that you were confronted and you had to make a choice. I don't care if you're the challenger or the challenge. I just want to see, are you going to duel or not? That's all I care about. So I don't care who's the challenger. I don't care who's right, who's wrong. It doesn't matter. right? And we don't care who the winner. I lost the duel. No big deal. right? I won the duel. No big deal. And here's one of the amazing things. What happened after the duel? Suppose they both live. Even if they don't live, one's dying. What did they do? They pull out a letter of apology. After I kill somebody, okay, now here's my, I'm sorry. Like, why didn't we do that before? Right? It makes no sense. But it only makes sense because there had to be the test. And once the test is done, once we both duel, we both demonstrate we're trustworthy, and now we can apologize because we're both members of this class, and now we can be friends. And there's all these, you know, Samuel Pepys writes about, you know, this guy, he kills this, kills this man, and he's holding him in his arms, and he's, you know, professing his love for him, what great friends he is. I just, he just killed him. But, you know, he could have said that earlier, but then that would defeat the whole purpose of the, uh, of the duel. 
So, and here's the other thing, there's no change in your social standing based on the outcome. So, as long as you do, there's no change in, in social standing. So, now, now we'll, we'll come to Aaron Burr. So, if you don't know, the most famous duel in the world is an American duel. Of course, you knew that anyway, right? And uh, it's between the Vice President of the United States, Colonel Aaron Burr, and the former Secretary of the Treasury and founding father, uh, Alexander Hamilton. There's an election going on. Hamilton, uh, Hamilton, write, it's Hamilton writes a letter. Hamilton writes a letter, several letters to the editor under a pseudonym, but that uh, insults Burr. Burr is upset and challenged Hamilton to a duel. Hamilton goes through this agonizing process about whether he should do it. He goes through all these reasons why he should not duel. You know, his son had just been killed in a duel. Uh, you know, he's not good for his family, on and on and on. But he concludes, my career will be over if I turn it down. Right? I am finished in political life if I turn it down because I demonstrate that I'm not trustworthy. And so they agree to duel. They duel. And uh, as you know, Aaron Burr kills Alexander Hamilton. Now, I'm going to get into an argument here, I know. But so what happens? Here's my take on what happens. Aaron Burr goes back to office, right? Goes over in the morning, kills Alexander Hamilton, goes back, you know, sits in his vice president's office. Thomas Jefferson walks by, how's your day? Oh, not too bad, I just killed Alexander Hamilton. Oh, hey, good for you, yeah. He finished out his term as vice president. Now, it's true, in the state of New York, where Alexander Hamilton had his friends, uh, they were very upset, they rallied against him, they tried to file charges, but of course, nothing ever comes of it. Right? And uh, after the term as, uh, as vice president, what happens to Aaron Burr? He's rewarded with a commission to go explore the uh, Louisiana Purchase and uh, map things out. He totally screws that up, but uh, you know he was given a commission afterwards. After he screws that up, he goes back to his home in New York. He finishes out a 25-year career as a lawyer, and when he dies, he's given full military honors uh, at his funeral. Nothing happened to him because he killed Aaron Burr. Disagree or agree? Is that I'll okay? agree for Thomas. Yeah, okay, so Thomas said, okay. Hey, there are certainly fans of, Aaron, of Alexander Hamilton who would say, you got that story totally wrong. And, uh, you know, Aaron Burr really was a, a bad man and uh, all those things. But but really, if you look at the what actually happened to him, he, just, he certainly never went to prison. And he was never charged and never convicted. Even though he did something that was illegal. Right? But he was a member of the ruling class. And he's a member of the patron system in the U.S. Uh, the key thing in a duel is the death, probably, it has to be a lottery. You can't, it has to be a random thing. That was very important. You're, 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 you're designing the duel around the probability of death. And it's very important that it's random. Because if it's not random, then some people are just going to be a great duelist. And the reason why I'm dueling is not because I'm invested. It's because I'm just a really great sword fighter. Or a really great shot. And you don't want that. Right? Those kind of people are they're wrong. They're 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 the pretenders. And so they did everything they could about the probability of death. So there's all kinds of rules, and for sake of time, I'm just gonna focus on, on a couple here. Um, dueling starts with epes. It starts actually with with rapiers, moves to epes, this this very flexible stabbing weapon which was very lethal, and then moves to sabers, a curved weapon which caused all kinds of damage but not quite as lethal. And then when pistols arrive, pistols kind of dominate. And the reason for that is, is because it was so much easier to randomize the outcome with pistols compared to swords. So I'm just going to focus on pistols here and uh, just talk about a few rules here. So the way you've probably seen movies and things where there's a duel, often they would stand back to back, they would walk a certain number of paces, turn and fire. Okay, Called a turn and fire rule. The re you are not allowed to do this. You are not allowed to say, okay, uh, I'm going to line up here. And could you move by that tree over there? I need a little... Uh, Little line up. You are not allowed to take your time. Okay? Turn, fire. You're, you're <coughs> supposed to point your weapon. You're not supposed to aim your weapon. If you're caught doing this kind of thing, that was cheating, and now you're in trouble. Uh, oops. The, uh, these weapons, they, they would stick with the pistols, they were very expensive, they were handcrafted, and uh, they were very well made. But they were made to be inaccurate. Some of the things that they did, so they made the, the, the muzzle, the, the barrel short. By making it short rather than longer, they, they make the, the, the bullet can go in more directions. If you've ever seen a James Bond movie at the beginning where there's that spiral when they're looking down the barrel of the gun and the blood always drips through? That's called rifling. By putting the spiral in the barrel, you make the pistol more accurate. No spirals. 
These are what are called smooth bore. So the ball is coming out, and again, it could go anywhere. Uh, they had no aiming beads. Now, everybody knew about aiming beads, but there were no aiming beads on the guns because you were not allowed to aim. It, it, this, would, this would allow for practice and all these kinds of things. Uh, they had all these fixed times, minimum firing rules, and this kind of thing. If you saw the Count of Monte Cristo where he, he's forced into a duel with his son, and he goes like this. Boom. And he shoots in the air. Gee, never allowed. Never happened. If you did that, uh, they just make you start all over again. So that was called dumb firing. Not allowed. Why? Because that's a, not a real duel. There had to be a probability of dying. Had to be random, and you actually had to take a shot at the other person. Uh, first blood rule, that's a fencing rule. Uh, they had these seconds at these things. The reason why you had seconds it would be your friend, a doctor, and a few other people. And if you look at any pictures of duels, there's always a half dozen people around, uh, around these things. They played a really important role. Uh, the role was to stop cheating. So they made sure that there were no illegitimate duels. No, no cheating going on, the reasons were fine. It made collusion very difficult, so it's one thing for me and another guy to collude and fake a duel, but now we've got to bring a dozen people in with all kinds of different interests. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, they made the duel as fair as possible, so they made sure that you know there are no trees behind somebody or that uh, you know, the weapons were always inspected ahead of time and all those kinds of things. And they did this. They both, sometimes they would insist that a duel has to take place so that the seconds would decide, this is a legitimate duel. The weapons are all fine. You, and the guy's getting nervous and wants to back out, no, you cannot back out. It must take place. This is a legitimate duel. If you back out, you're out of the system. So they would insist that the, that the duel takes place. But other times they would say, this is not a legitimate duel. The weapons are biased. You know, one weapon is rifled, the other one is not. Or, you know, there's something going on here that is illegitimate. And so they would, they would reject the duel. And they were allowed to reject the duel, and then the people would be okay. Your uh, President Lincoln. President Lincoln was involved in a duel. Mary Todd writes a letter to a newspaper under again under a, a assumed name and insults the editor. The editor challenges whoever wrote the letter to a duel. Lincoln stands up for Mary and uh, accepts the duel. And uh, there's a little tiny skinny guy who is the editor. And what does Lincoln do? Lincoln chooses as a weapon a broadsword, uh, which is some sort of broad axe or something. Some weapon that was so big and heavy, this poor little guy couldn't even lift it up. And uh, the, the seconds reject the duel, and Lincoln, oh, and so his social standing never changed, but Lincoln apparently in his own mind thought that it was a, a, the wrong, the duel should have carried through. And apparently for the rest of his life, if you mentioned that duel, it was the only way to get on his bad side. That, uh, you know, he, as far as he was concerned, it was an illegitimate outcome. But, uh, but anyway, his, his, uh, his second rejected the duel. And these are the people that made the duel public. Right? These are the ones who went around and told everybody that the duel actually happened. Last one. So, just if this dueling only took place in the patronage system, if there was no patronage, there was no dueling. So, in England, there was a 20 year period where Oliver Cromwell rules, and uh, he rules kind of a theocracy, no patronage, and there was no dueling. Right? right in the heart, right in the middle of the most dueling period, there's no dueling. Why? Because there was no patronage. China, China had a different system for establishing trustworthy servants. It was part exams, part castration. So they had this, this unit class that, uh, that was the way they, and I don't think it worked very well. <laughs> uh, that's how most of the rest of the world actually created their bureaucrats, was that system. That you basically removed the threat that you would have children and therefore restricted the incentives you had to cheat the monarch. But, uh, cost. What? Talk about it, some yeah, it's an enormous cost, right? So I'm working with a paper on with Pete Leeson. We're trying to contrast Unix with uh, the aristocrats, but uh, um, but anyway, they did not have dueling. They had a different system, and uh, they didn't have dueling. They didn't have patronage. They didn't have dueling. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second. Women, women were not involved in the civil administration. They were not involved in patronage, and they were not allowed to duel. Uh, Jews. Jews were not allowed to uh, be part of the civil administration. Jews were not allowed to duel. Uh, business people were not part of the civil administration. They were not allowed to duel. So, no patronage, no dueling. Why did it all end? Well, I'll just throw these up here. It ended because what happened in the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution. What happened was that the world started to measure things. For the first time in history, 
we could start to measure. Go back in time. For the first time in history, we could measure an hour. When you can measure an hour, and not only society could measure an hour, but we invented the watch. So you, on your own, could measure an hour. That means now I can work for an hour. And I know that I'm not being ripped off, I'm not being paid for 45 minutes, or I'm not working an hour and a half for an hour. Uh, I could work for an hour. So for the first time in the 19th century, we get what we would call employees. People that have a job. They're not the servant of anybody. They're not under somebody's lordship. They're not bound by somebody. They don't have to live in his house. Uh, they're not, they can decide to work or not work. And when they work, they get paid a wage. We get markets developed in ways that we recognize now. You would not recognize the way markets existed in the 18th or 17th century. And why is this the case? Because now we measure. And we measure like crazy. And we remove nature from so many things. Even when we, if something happens called an accident, we're very good at figuring out who's at fault. Right? The space shuttle blows up in midair, there's only little bits and pieces. I mean, it's incredible. We can figure out, narrow it down to some little ring washer, uh, what the problem was. Uh, we can measure today like, like crazy. And so when you can measure, now people can't cheat me. Now I don't care about trusting you. Last night I slept in this Hilton Hotel in town, and they tell me that I was not allowed to smoke there. They don't have to trust me to not smoke. That room is full of sensors. Right? They can measure if I smoke or not. They don't have to trust me. And we live in a world where trust is good, but we don't rely on it as much as they used to. And if we don't rely on trust, we don't need patronage. If we don't need patronage, we don't need aristocrats. Right? And if we don't need aristocrats, we don't need dueling. And so when we started to measure, we got rid of all of these things. Now, let's go back to this word. The aristocrats voluntarily gave up power. Why did they voluntarily give up power? How come they didn't have to give up power at the end of a gun? Why was there no revolution? And the answer is quite simple. They were engaged in this very costly way of living. They amassed a huge fortune, but of course that's not going to happen anymore. I mean, they, they lost all these positions. Uh, they, they, these positions are gone. So what's the point of maintaining this enormous house? What's the, what's the point of putting on these massive parties for the village? What's the point of learning Latin? There's no point. And so they stopped. They stopped voluntarily because there was nothing that cost to them. And, uh, and no benefits. And so they voluntarily gave it up. They sold out. And so at the beginning of this period, King Henry VIII confiscated 25% of the land and created these groups. What happened in 1911? Between 1911 and 1920, about 25% of the land was sold. They just sold out. They tore down these houses. And uh, you know, still built big mansions, but they tore down the houses, got rid of the parks, got rid of the libraries, dismantled. Dismantled so quickly that the federal government in England came along and said, we're creating the National Trust. And we don't want to get rid of these things. These things are part of the uh, National Treasures, and they bought them. And so today, you know, you can still go and see, you know, maybe 30 or 40 of these great homes. They exist, but they exist as museums. Uh, but otherwise, they would have been completely torn down. So we shouldn't feel sorry for the aristocrats. They made a lot of money. They're still incredibly rich. But uh, now they're just like you and me. They're uh, just eating a living. Anyway, that's it. I hope that I demonstrate to you one that there's a huge puzzle and that economics can be very useful in explaining a huge puzzle. And that we don't have to pass judgment on these people. They're just doing what you do. They're just trying to do the best they could with what they have. Anyway, thanks. because they were sucking the wealth out of everybody else. But I don't, that's sort of the Marxist view of these things. I don't think that's true. I think if you look, what was happening to the wealth of everybody else? It was exploding, right? So, so no, I shouldn't say exploding, but uh, certainly from, from 1800 on, wealth is starting to explode, right? So wealth for the first time in history, per capita wealth, growing at two or three percent, never did that before. But uh, 
England is becoming powerful. England is growing in total wealth. Sure, these guys are getting wealthy, but everybody else is getting wealthy too. Maybe not the commoners quite so much, but uh, uh, there's no evidence that they that they that they suck wealth from these people. What about the African slaves? Oh, I outside of uh, outside of England, yeah, you might claim that that so. Okay, so so England as a they colonize, right? They come to some places like Canada. They come to some places like Canada and the United States where they have a very small indigenous population. And what do they do? They basically moved here. They brought with them all their institutions, and of course we benefited from all that kind of stuff. But they showed up in other places like Africa, where there was large populations, and rather than moving there, what they decided to do was extract. Right? And so they extract people, they extract resources, and you could call that just a word theft. So I would agree with you there, that uh, in some places like India and, and Africa, they extracted wealth and stole. But I wasn't thinking about the, the colonies that way. I wonder what, uh, you know, the other thing too, I'm not sure you'd say the aristocrats were involved, so I mean, they were certainly involved to some extent, but uh, much of the slave trade was done by merchants and business people, and uh, not not by the aristocrats. But they might have aspired to the aristocrats. They might have uh, tried to use the wealth to become uh, aristocrats, but. Uh... Yeah. No. One more. I've got. One. Okay. Good. Uh, My doodle buddy. The, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, settle. Oh, we have an arm muscle. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, one thing that I missed in this was how they perpetuated the wealth. I mean, because obviously with the sunk cost, they, they may start out as merchants that were aspiring to be part of the aristocracy, but once they bought their estate and invested the wealth dollars, where did they, that, that like the okay. income of 10,000 sure, sure. where did that come from? Okay, great, great question. If you, I don't know if you know who Samuel Pepys was. Samuel Pepys was this guy who was a junior administrator in the Navy in the middle of the 17th century. We only know about him because he wrote this incredible diary for 10 years. And uh, he becomes uh, very powerful in the country. And uh, But he documents how he made his fortune. And the way they made their fortune was, so you hang out at court. So a lot of these guys are hanging out at court and they're waiting for an assignment. The assignment might be really minor, like, okay, the, your patron has a message he wants to send to some French minister or something. And so he has to trust you with that. But you would be rewarded for that. You know, you're a mailman and you get paid for it. But it might be much more significant than that. I mean, you would be given what were called offices. So if you remember uh, Thomas Cromwell there, he was the Lord of the Privy Seal. So that was an office that was part of the administrative machine of the state. And underneath it were hundreds of offices. And so he would sell those offices. So he'd say, okay, somebody, I need somebody, a clerk. Okay, are you going to pay me 300 pounds to become a clerk? Okay, and now every time you process a piece of paper, somebody would come to the administration, they would pay him, Cromwell would get a piece of that action. So, again, the more important the office, the closer you were to the pyramid, and you would be receiving funds. This is what's so bizarre when I said at the beginning, you would not recognize this world. You, there was no public official the way we think about it. Everybody was private, and everybody had their office. So, here's Samuel Pepys, he's a naval administrator, and he is taking bribes. We would call them bribes, but they were just the way he was paid. And people would say, I'd like a naval contract. Here's some, fork, here's some cow's tongue, or here's some gold plate, or, and I'm not joking, here's my wife, right? And Samuel Pepys, I mean, documents how he's having sex with all these married women that people are saying, here's my wife, uh, you know, have sex with her. And that, he took these payments unabashedly, totally in public. It was just the way things were done. So the, he, Samuel Pepys, made money hand over fist. And he didn't just have one office. Some people had 30, 40 offices, and uh, the rewards were enormous. So they were not making their money off their farmland. There would be some rents generated, but uh, the bulk of their money came from these offices. What historians call the old corruption, right? This idea of this private office woman. Lighthouse is another one. You know, I own a lighthouse. Your ship comes by, you don't pay me, lights off, right? And uh, lights on, you pay me. So, uh, you know, you own a lighthouse, and people pay you money for it. That's where the money came from. As long as their wives didn't look like a horse and smell. Uh, the horse and smell, yeah. And see, Pete's, if you knew Pete, you probably didn't care, but uh, anyway. Yeah, Pete's, I would highly recommend his diary. It's just incredible. It really makes you realize what a weird world it was. Well, thank you very much. You've been a great audience.